thank you to Enlisted for sponsoring this video, more on them a little later on. Um, I don't even know where to start with you. I mean, do you even know who you're talking to? Do you have any idea, any idea who I am? Basically, kind of a big deal. Yeah, I'm that guy who got blown by Payday 3. Oh, man, that's beautiful. Oh. You listening? Okay. Grass grows, birds fly, sun shines, and brother, I'm a poor judge of video games. Woo! Let's find out if you can beat Payday 2 as Team Fortress 2's one and only scout. I am never, and I mean never, doing an accent like that again. Anyway, let's get into the rule set, because this has to be the most open to interpretation I think I've ever had, given that Scout's three defining characteristics are that he's fast, from Boston, and can jump on thin air. Other than that, we're going to have to do a fair bit of reading between the lines to create a strict set of stipulations to make a challenge worth running. As ever, we're going to be playing through Payday 2's career mode from start to finish. By playing as the Scout, we're limiting our arsenal to a set of specific weapons. Scout's top primary and many of his shotguns are a little bit challenging to transfer over to Payday 2's realistically inspired weapons. Obviously, he uses double barrel shotguns, so all of those are fair game, meaning the Moscone 12 gauge and Jocelyn will be usable in the primary slot, and I will be allowing the Claire 12 gauge shotgun as well, but seeing as it falls into that secondary category, it's unlikely to see that much of a spotlight ahead of the available pistols. The crux of the scattergun is that it is, if nothing else, lever action, meaning I'm comfortable allowing the breaker 12 gauge, but no pump or mag loaded shotguns, meaning in total we have a core arsenal consisting of three primary and one secondary shotgun. In the general secondary slot, Scout offers three distinct pistol options. Stock, obviously, which as of the engineer run, we've already ascertained can be represented by the group of Kurs, the Winger, which I'm happy to swap out for the Deagle in Payday 2, and finally the Pretty Boy's Pocket Pistol, which is about as close to the M13 9mm as we can get. In the melee slot, we can use any form of baseball bat, including the Lucille, the Morning Star, which is just about similar enough to the sun on the stick in my eyes, and finally, Cleave is a fair game, given the flying guillotine's existence. Throwables are banned outside of Molotovs when used for self-damage, as flashbangs are just too strong, just look at the sniper run for reference as to why. Additionally, I won't be allowing elemental special rounds to be loaded into my shotguns, so no Tombstone or Dragon's Breath, as they're just a little too derivative from the Scout's MO in my opinion. And I'll also be banning suppressors, making stealth slightly harder so that we're encouraged to go loud whenever possible. After these stipulations, you know the drill. Start at level 0, inch me 0, no grinding for money or XP, everything must be played solo, offline, crew AI is always allowed for stealth heist only, mods will be kept to a minimum outside of the usual vanilla HUD+, plus, although I was spoiled for choice when it came to scout-specific mods on Mod Workshop. Instead of making things a bit messy and tough to replicate, I've decided to keep things simple with the Double Jump mod and the Scout as Jimmy conversion. It might be sacrilege to replace Jimmy with anyone in my eyes, but Scout is just about forgiven, as this is probably the best voice replacement mod I can ever remember playing with in Payday 2. The double jump though actually changes some things up, adding new pathing options on many heists in the game that I'll be trying to leverage as much as possible. Finally, we will always play heists on the highest available difficulty, capping at Deathwish, meaning mayhem up to level 80 and Deathwish from then onwards. Lifelines are gone from the TF2 runs for the time being, meaning enough said, it's time to get prepped for the run. Which is the perfect segue into the sponsor of today's video, Enlisted, a squad-based FPS available for free on PC and console that blends the PvE combat payday fans know and love with phenomenally in-depth PvP. In Enlisted, you'll take command of a crew of AI-controlled soldiers, leading them into combat against squads of other players around many of the most crucial battles in the history of World War II. You'll be able to fight on the side of many of the most powerful Ally and Axis combatants, making use of their iconic arsenals with over 400 weapons, tanks and aircraft in total. If you're used to the incredible build customization of Payday 2, this should appeal already. With top-tier strategic gameplay as you leverage the distinctive roles and abilities of your soldiers in battle, Enlisted is an FPS unlike any other, with a great deal of authentic respect for the period and history it covers. Even better for new or returning players, Enlisted has just received a huge metagame update, introducing new mechanics, superior matchmaking, and dozens of improvements to gameplay. There has been no better time to set foot in the new era of Enlisted. You can play the game for free on PC, PlayStation or Xbox right now by using my link in the description. New players on PC will also receive a special bonus pack that includes multiple items, 4,000 silver and a 3-day premium account boost. Be sure to grab this offer before it goes away for good. Heading straight in, we send Yelwomp back to square one to kick off this challenge. As a proud owner of all Payday 2 DLCs at this point, I can really dive into all the fashion options available. We all know TF2 is all about the cosmetics, so it's imperative that we go into any heist looking the part. 
Unfortunately, the downside of owning every DLC is that it now takes an age for an actual completable starting host to show up randomly on CrimeNet, meaning it was about 5 minutes before a car shop actually showed up. As is often the case, heist number 1 is a tough prospect, with no feasible options to actually deal with guards at this stage. As a result, attempt 1 was cut short when I was spotted lockpicking downstairs, leaving a dominated guard that was bound to be spotted. I was caught out heading into the offices on attempt 2, and then once more after I was unable to hide the manager out of line of sight of the many second floor patrols. With run 4 being a carbon copy, RNG was doing me no favours today. My impatience on attempt 5 was punished after finding the manager in his office but not checking both ways before crossing the corridor. On attempt 6, I actually managed to interrupt the manager during his informal meeting and move the sieves out of line of sight, having to keep them under control in the stairwell. Unfortunately, after starting the hack on the IT tech's computer, my little entourage was finally spotted, naturally causing a chain reaction and forcing an early point of no return. With no skills, I wasn't yet the speed demon I wanted to become, meaning after setting up the C4 and securing the keys, I was about 5 seconds short of actually completing this one, timing out on Car Shop for the first time in a run. Unable to steal home this time, another flurry of failure followed on. Again, the comedic timing of Civs turning corners at just the wrong moments felt scripted as yet another two scattergun runs went awry. Finally, on attempt 9, I snapped, deciding these Civs had had it too good for too long, just accepting the cleaner costs to keep the run alive. I'm never entirely sure how bonking Civs on the head should be ruled for during these challenge runs, especially with that being against the rules for guards, but if running them over is fair game, this probably should be too, especially when it saves an attempt and actually gets us into the run proper. Now that Car Shop is out of the way, we can start thinking about our build. Sadly, our initial skills are pretty much always challenge run staples to help get us through the early game, but where I can start building into a force of nature is in my perk deck of choice. I've decided in true 2015 payday fashion to go with Rogue for a pure luck-based dodge build, with Yakuza being a support deck especially useful for stealth heists. I know that means we won't be moving at max speed for most heists, which is disappointing, but I'm wedging my head through a door here to tell you I'm sorry, but honestly the idea of a Yakuza loud run makes me feel sick to my stomach, so Rogue is a nice compromise, as we'll still be inexplicably dodging bullets 50% of the time. The early build in place, it's time for Jewelry Store, and with no true healing in this build and only 4 FAKs to go around, I go for Control early on, moving the first few bags in stealth and getting the safe half open before being forced loud. Equipped with the Breaker and Gruber for this one due to their minuscule costs, I was feeling a little underpowered, needing 3 shots to deal with specials, which really hurts the old ammo economy. Safe to say, we need some more shotgun skills to feel decently powerful on this run. Still, somehow this ended up being a first timer, as the cops help by moving the bags next to the escape unwittingly, allowing me to shuffle them only 20 meters to the van to clear this heist. Fortunately, without bumping into a single dozer. The pivotal reward for this clear was the perk deck experience I could pump into Rogue, securing the helmet popping boost which enabled me to hurt people just a little more, pushing the breaker into that all important two shot breakpoint for specials. I also had the cash to purchase the M13 9mm for some minor stat boosts in loud, which I immediately put to use on the standard bank heist, double jumping over the fence for a stylish entry. With a little guile, I was actually able to slip inside the camera room and rap assassinate the guard inside, allowing me to get to the drill before going loud. Even at this early level, the bank heist is rarely a struggle, as I took out my first green dozer of the run with comparative ease. Skull dozers are a different story, and as these guys now seem to appear as common mayhem obstacles, we need to be vigilant, using my superior mobility to actually just run rings around this one, flanking towards the escape and taking out this sniper, who camped the whole time for nothing. Amusingly, because of how shotguns work in Payday 2, they'll actually be an excellent option up against the Aussie run-enders that are so common throughout. Once again, time to change up the build, creating a stealth setup with a brand new high concealment breaker coming in at a comfortable 13 detection risk for Diamond Store. After batting up against the camera guard, I got myself caught out by a sieve trying to double jump over a dumpster, leading to quite the mad scramble as I sprinted back and forth to juggle pages and passes by, throwing in a second, third and fourth beating absolutely free. Before I knew it, I'd already cleared all the guards off the map and just needed to turn off the alarms and start moving the bags. Again, only as many sieves as I had cable ties for were actually safe, where's Payday 3's wolf when you need him? At this point, I was starting to wish I'd gone for points in Yakuza before Rogue to speed up highs like this one, but I'm sure in the long run, Rogue will do me well. Without the cash in the bank to upgrade to a double barrel shotgun, I stuck with the breaker for Go Bank. On run 1, something rather strange occurred. After opening the vault, finding some cash and grabbing the cage parts, 
it became apparent that there was literally nowhere to assemble it. The objective had simply disappeared. Not a lot I could do about this one as a sniper put an end to my misery and complete confusion. If you have any idea what happened, do let me know. We'll never know if the objective was going to show up on attempt 2, as a pair of dozers found out my build's complete damage deficiency. I was nearly put in the ground in the exact same way on attempt 3, when a Skulldozer decided to cozy up in the vault with me, but an FAK saved the day this time, and Lard Fat over here's hard arteries don't stop bullets. From there, I got my second wind, getting the cage set up on the roof this time, where snipers made my life harder than I would have liked, especially with my distinct lack of an accurate weapon to fire at them. After the cage was picked up, I headed back to the bank lobby but was rapidly forced outside, flanking around the pursuing dozers instead of facing them head on. Once more, I couldn't land a shot on a sniper to save my life, going through FAK after FAK until Payday's entire video game genre changed when a dozer rolled up on me, menacingly, only to wander off like some sort of outlast survival horror enemy without any explanation. End of Assault SWAT AI is always a bit goofy, but this was a huge opportunity for me to sprint directly to the sewers, and fortunately, even with only 20% dodge chance, the snipers couldn't put a stop to me. I guess they'll never hit my tiny head. It's so tiny, I've got a freaking such a tiny little head to keep alive and kicking all the way to the escape. Despite all the sniper showboating, I'd still rather not lean on luck against them in the future, purchasing a huge pistol upgrade in the form of the 100% accurate Deagle. I also grabbed a saw to speed up the upcoming transport heist. Downtown was first, which is often a variation of the heist that's just too difficult for this stage in any run, but the Deagle really was quite impressive, winging most cops instantly and taking them down in at most three shots, whilst also one-shotting snipers with ease. Double jump is also a massive utility on a heist like this one, opening up new traversal options over the parked cars and even from floor to floor on this sprawling maze of a heist. I had one incredibly close call with a Skulldozer right as I picked up the final bag of cash needed to escape, but with one last FAK, I just about had enough left in my legs to outspeed the heavy and make it to the chopper escape. This one broke the record for the longest ever transport run on a challenge, and highlighted that if I was going to stay afloat on a future 10 minute plus heist, I'd need a passive form of healing. Transport Park is up next, probably the easiest variation we can roll into, which was a nice change of pace, allowing me to showcase just what the Deagle is capable of, and successfully come out on top of a Skulldozer 1v1. As a wise man once said, Nice hustle, tons of fun! Next time eat a salad! Wow, I've, I've really got better at that voice. Anyway, the more open and spacious a heist, the stronger this build feels, with all of its crazy mobility options, which is why Transport Park was ideal. But, speed and mobility alone won't be enough to slog through the dreaded train heist. First, I grabbed Hostage Taker to keep me afloat during such a potentially lengthy heist. Then I set up my breaker with slug rounds, meaning shields could actually be dealt with from any angle. Heading in, Double Jump opens up new routes for stealth, but unfortunately I slipped up and things went loud early on. The slugs were working, which was just as well as the shields were coming out of the damned walls. Having a solution for shields has become even more important for these challenges after the advent of the marshals, who start spawning in on any more drawn out heist to give me some new headaches. I'm a fan of war, but head on brawls with dozers don't tend to earn well, so instead I was basically training them around the carriages whilst moving the loot bags when I had the opportunity, playing around my mobility to reach the end of each assault wave and get just a little bit of respite. The Deagle's perfect accuracy made it easy to keep on top of the Aussie population, meaning as long as I kept grabbing bundles of ammo to keep the regular SWATs at bay, I had just enough firepower to force my way to an intense but still successful first time clear. That's the Payday 2 early game hump conquered, meaning we can now spend all our extra cash picking up both primary double barrel shotgun options, keeping the Moscone for potential low detection risk crit builds, using Buckshot for now, and setting up the massively underrated Jocelyn with Flechette to be a true sniper destroyer in the future. Sprinting through Vlad's early jobs, I switched over to Shape Chargers to speed through four stores, showcasing the already impressive power of the Moscone. This gave me enough skill points to try out Overkill for a massive damage boost on the Jocelyn. I was dropped by a couple of the ultra powerful shield units early into attempt 1, but that just meant I got to enjoy the satisfaction of shooting out multiple panes of glass in one shot a second time around. So jokes on them, I wanted to die. The Jocelyn is genuinely decent with flechette rounds when played in that medium to long range space, opening up a new unexpected playstyle. It's a fun weapon that will remain in my arsenal for any high traffic sniper heist, dragging me to another easy victory on More Crasher and then on White Xmas, a heist that's basically made for long range weaponry. 
I've started to learn that with all my extra jumps and movement speed, I can run circles around shields, meaning slugs aren't mandatory, quickly firing me to yet another first time clear. For Ukrainian job, I switched over to a stealth build, taking control of the rear officers with the usual Boston Basher approach. Here I ran into a Civ variant that I don't remember ever seeing in a heist. I'm guessing her appearance was tied to whatever RNG rolled this meeting and additional security guard over here, but it's crazy that I can still be discovering new things in this game after more than 3,000 hours. This was another drill waiting sim, hitting the results screen with no further incident, but really having to question, who the hell did I headshot? I didn't fire a bullet, so maybe baseball bats have counted as firearms now. Again, another confusing moment on this run. But we move on to Meltdown next, where I get caught up making a 3 point turn with a forklift truck and end up down by a couple of shields. I actually managed to make it outside on attempt 2, which turned out to house the 9 circles of hell, as I tipped over the truck, got flashbanged, rubbed my blurry eyes to see nuclear warheads scattered all over the place, got tased not once but twice, flashed again and finally put in the ground just as my vision was returning for a second time. That dramatic conclusion couldn't be matched on attempt 3, although this can be one hell of a cinematic heist. A simple score those up at a short stop to this one during my search for the second crowbar. On attempt 4, things got a little weird, with this murky water foot soldier defying gravity from beyond the grave. This time I actually managed to deal with a few dozers before earning the clay pigeon shooting achievement for destroying the spawning snipers with my flechette loaded Jocelyn, a genuinely effective strategy up against them. It was a good job I could handle those pests as I was unable to locate the final crowbar, needing to hold out against multiple waves to get the vault to overheat. The M13 was also doing its part now that I had points in trigger happy, massively increasing the damage of subsequent shots. This was enough to start moving the warheads over to the Longfellow, delivering the first set without much resistance before returning to the shipping yard and landing an absolutely sumptuous cross map shot. This Jocelyn has got to be one of the best sniper killing weapons I've had at my disposal on a challenge, which is a relief as Rogue never feels secure up against them. With most snipers dead and buried, I had all the space I needed to hop back in the muscle car and screech my way back to the train yard for a satisfying victory. Aftershock is up next, debuting the trigger happy deagle which can even tear through dozers at this point. The first section of this heist was fairly laboured, owing to the slow movement of the bags not really meshing with my build, as I had to juggle shields and dozers whilst trying not to get bogged down on the overpass. Eventually the C4 arrived, meaning I had access to the escape truck which I duly used to ram through the vast majority of the pursuing cops on my way back to the weapon safes. With all 12 secure in storage, once again flechette rounds, this time on the breaker, proved their worth in cutting down snipers from just about any range. Instead of holding at the escape as usual, I flanked back to the ammo bag meaning I was forced to push back into a wave of oncoming spawns, landing an atomic punch as my pellet spread tore through them. Even with this much firepower, I had a close call with this taser and sniper combo on the escape as he almost held me in place to be executed, but dodge luck was on my side once more as Bayer rocked up with impeccable timing for a slightly fast and loose first time escape. I wouldn't have it any other way on this run though as I picked up my final dodge perk, bringing me to a base total of 50% dodge chance for all upcoming heists. Thanks to hostage takers regen, I was comfortable switching over to shape charges for stealing Xmas, speeding through the objectives and demolishing dozers with this emerging Mosconian deagle combo. This build will only get stronger from here when I finally get crit online. Eventually I found the right angle to approach the rooftop from, taking a leap of faith through the skylight which is only made possible thanks to the power of double jump, leaving most cop spawns completely out of position and opening up the space for an easy escape. Nightclub next, which was boring as ever, until it suddenly wasn't when this Skulldozer put me down with little more than a glance. It's easy to forget that without some decent luck you really are a complete glass cannon with Rogue. On attempt 2 I avenged myself upon Dozer Kind with the high DPS of the M13, making further use out of my double jump's amazing flank potential to draw all cops into the main office to do battle with my jokers whilst I slipped away in the commotion. We were still forced into this run's first escape, during which a taser and dozer teamed up for a classic zap and double tap attempt, which I slipped out of in the last second, surviving by the skin of my teeth and riding that adrenaline all the way to heist completion. Watch Dogs is next, a heist that's usually defined more so by its silly ragdoll incidents than it is by its difficulty, turning this lad into Mr. Fantastic with severe scoliosis before cruising to an easy escape via armoured vehicle. Switching over to the breaker, this thing with overkill is legitimately DSOD viable after recent ammo buffs, so it took no time at all to breeze through this one, finally getting the upper hand on a dozer for the first time in the run. Firestarter was much of the same, although I only remember to turn on shadow play during the final seconds of an easy day one. 
The confidence I had in my bill was such that I even secured the goat just to rub salt into the wound on day two, and the trigger happy deagle on day three is an immaculate counter to dozers in general, as I'm starting to even get used to the skull variants constantly harassing the mayhem section of these runs. Another multi dayer in the bag, Raz is Hector's final job, as I pick up shock and awe to help versus shields. Finally, I can give them a special delivery of Buckshot without having to jump around them like a man possessed. Shotguns tend to rule the roost on day one of Rats, providing complete control over the meth lab and any roadside snipers who fancy getting involved, comfortably dragging us onto day two, where for once I took pity on the Cobras and left empty handed, before knocking the Mendozas out of the park on day three. Big Oil is the first of the elephant's jobs, starting about as poorly as you can imagine, as I waddle my dumb ass straight into an electric fence before the screen had even fully faded from black. Fortunately, the Overkill MC have blasted out their eardrums after years of biking, meaning I still had time to drop down an ECM before they reacted to the noise. This meant I still had the opportunity to clear them off the map, find the address, and head into day two uncontested. For this heist, I put together a hybrid Moscone build, allowing me to stealth up until reaching the basement, giving me a huge advantage as Bao was already on his way to pick up the correct engine before the SWATs had arrived. Jokers really are the key of successful hybrid setups, providing the distraction I needed to cruise through and escape this heist via the biplane. Sticking with the stealth setup for day one of framing frame, I had a little slip up as soon as I wandered into the art gallery, saving the situation by dominating the first guard I saw, before calling on the Sandman to put the guy on the front desk to sleep. After hiding the bodies, I took care of cams the same way, before making off with just the four requisite paintings. Day 2 is almost filler when you complete Day 1 in stealth, meaning we move on to the dreaded Day 3, sticking with a hybrid crit Moscone for a chance at stealth, but with plenty of tools to stay afloat if things did go loud. Attempt 1 did so before I'd managed to procure all the stored tech, although this guy clearly didn't get the memo, remaining completely chilled whilst his mates engaged in light BDSM only about a foot away. This run was ended prematurely by an ultra-aggressive Skulldozer, cutting down my incredibly fragile build in an instant. This convinced me I should probably make a better stab at stealth if at all possible, actually finding all five of the required items as well as locating the vault upstairs early into the run. Things were going great until I slightly overestimated my athletic capabilities, parkouring directly off the top balcony and through the gas skylight to speed up the bag moving process without ever landing, meaning my stored momentum sent my femurs to live with my scapula. Not ideal. I couldn't land a crit to save my life on attempt 3, meaning eventually this dozer just got fed up and deleted me off the map. And finally on attempt 4, I got a bit of momentum behind me, going loud early but actually managing to stay alive past the 5 minute mark. After soda popping this dozer directly in the chops and earning the bang for the buck achievement, I finally started to get a little momentum behind me, although this stage of the heist is always a nightmare as the cops funnel towards their one true purpose in life, the penthouse power supply. Even with almost ideal spawn locations for the main floor power boxes, keeping the hat going for more than 10 seconds at a time was a genuine achievement, so hellbent to the swats on turning it off. After an erratic tug of war taking more than double the match duration of the hack to even get close to uploading the files, I came incredibly close to being atomized by a taser who held me directly in front of an Isma dozer. In a moment of divine intervention, something broke the taser's line of sight at a key moment, and the dozer couldn't land a single shot in the meantime, allowing me to take him off the map alongside his partner in justice just moments later. Failing this late into a heist as frustrating as framing frame might have just broken me, so Bane must have been watching over me from that big bank in the sky. In the end, we made it through the hack and slipped out just moments later, but this ultra high concealment build is being shelved until I can grab overkill to make it a little more consistent. Election day is a walk in the park compared to framing frame, intentionally tagging the wrong truck on day one before double jumping my way to an easy silent escape. For day two on plan C, I move back to the Jocelyn, the perfect weapon to take the snipers who love to overwatch the vault out on respawn with. This time I remember to bring drill skills and some extra shape charges to save a couple of minutes, sprinting to the escape van where I absolutely demolished the overwatch from more than 60 meters away. It's crazy, this run has actually dealt better with snipers than any other I can remember, which is unexpected given it's predominantly using shotguns and rogue. No complaints from me as we head over to Big Bank. As the final mayhem heist of this run, it's more about getting through this one quickly than doing anything too flashy. I grabbed the saw to speed through objectives, not for the first or last time on this run, a taser just had mercy on my poor broken body, dropping his concentration and freeing me at a crucial moment early into this one. After breaking through the time lock to set up the thermite at the vault, it was time for a final victory lap for this build before we have to up the difficulty. 
right as we're about to up the ante, I finally feel like I have the DPS to go toe to toe with dozers and actually seek them out instead of running and hiding. It's like that epiphany you get when you're actually playing TF2 and you realise that Scout has a good matchup into Heavy if you know what you're doing. I've also got a hell of a lot better at using martial shields to my advantage, using them as a replenishable flashbang from time to time to help up against tasers. With a saw at the ready to clear up the vault, this heist was never in any doubt, as I quickly hopped down into the elevator shaft, graduating to level 80 and the dreaded Deathwish difficulty. Leveling up to Deathwish on Hotline Miami is scary stuff. I have to straighten up my gameplay at this point. 7am, case the motel, run background checks on Bobblehead Bob. Can he be trusted? If not, I gotta kill him. Dispose of the body, replacing with my own guy no later than 4.30. Damn. No matter how prepared you think you are, rogue builds are never ready for the power of Bronco Cops. Fortunately, on attempt 2 of Hotline Miami, the Russians started to make my job easier, with this one deciding to go out on his own terms, completely out of nowhere. Proceeding with the objectives on day 1, the Flechette Breaker once again had absolute control over the entire sniper population, although I was having a noticeably tougher time on Deathwish if I didn't roll crits. In any case, coupled with the pocket pistol, I had more than enough DPS to control the basement and secure the correct barcode, fleeing the heist immediately with pure pace on my side. On day 2 I managed to survive a boiling inferno and fix a thermal drill, yet lost a simple 2v1 against a couple of shields. Honestly, all jokes aside, this run is incredibly intense to play through. Rogue is a fine deck, but you never feel far from death with it, so secure moments are few and far between, and just about everything remains a threat if I make enough consecutive mistakes. Fortunately, I cleaned up my gameplay for attempt 2, with also helping that the drill only broke down once throughout the entire process, saving me from risking it all through the fire and flames to fix it. The Commissar had to say goodbye to his kneecaps after the Deagle was done with them, meaning all that was left was for me to hide out inside the flaming vault until Bile arrived to get me out of there. This gave me enough experience to cap off the final road perk and start working on Yakuza next, heading to Austin Breakout at close to the peak of my powers. But if this is as good as it gets, we might be in trouble, as run 1 was ended by a surprise dozer I simply didn't have enough time to react to on only the first turn of the gauntlet. Attempt 2 made it much further, all the way into the car park, where I was forced against my nature to stand still lot picking doors for 20 seconds a pop, which is long enough to dull the sensors and allow a heavy SWAT to candy cane my ass back to the loading screen. At this point, I'll admit I'm reaching with these puns, but I swear these character weapons are getting harder and harder to fit into a script. Attempt 3 was as disappointing as my modern scripting abilities, with a single green dozer chewing through my entire health pool in just one shot. Attempt 4 was the one though, as I made it all the way through to the car park with very few scares, finding the control room after a minute straight of holding the F key, and taking care of the school dozer within to start up the bollard hack. This dozer prioritised the PC over potentially taking me out, meaning I was let off the hook and able to escape the day just a minute later. Things don't get much easier on day 2 though, as straight up after earning the knock knock achievement for slug round kills on shields, I was tased, barely able to get back into cover, but followed in by Heavy Swat, who gave me a merciless flying guillotine to the back of my neck. The next attempt went much further, reaching the final external Hotson objective before double jumping down from the upper floor, straight into the not so loving arms of a green dozer who shot me out of the sky like I was a clay pigeon. That one hurt morale a lot more than the next one, which was mercifully quick at the hands of those ultra powerful FBI units at the entrance, taking us on to day 2, attempt 4. This time I managed to get a little foothold into the heist, actually winning my first minigun dozer fight against all odds with only the M13, if only by a hair. With my slug round breaker acting as my core utility option, this was starting to feel like more of a pistol run at this point, although I'm not complaining as that's another Payday 2 playstyle that doesn't get enough love in my opinion. In the end, I had a keycard left over to open up the door to the basement, allowing me to force through the completion without any more turmoil. I am such a glass cannon at this stage of the run, so I realise I'm going to have to adapt to a slightly safer playstyle. Hotstar Revenge is a great opportunity for me to test out the power of this more long range setup. Upping the ante from the one minigun dozer I fought on Hotstar Breakout, this time I was forced to hold off two of the behemoths, although the Deagle provides more than enough firepower to out DPS them with just average dodge luck. Now, I've killed plenty of rats in my time running this game. They're all dime a dozen backstabbing scumbags, like Hector. And it was no different on this challenge, blasting the kingpin back to Colombia with a 16 round special. All that was left for me now was to gather up the intel, a far easier task than usual bearing in mind the FBI safe house was basically built to be traversed with double jumps. As long as I kept the snipers in check, I was free to leap from roof to roof, moving the payday gang evidence with ease and clearing the heist. 
With three Deathwish Heists in the bag already, I have enough XP to commit to a second perk deck, specifically the Dreaded Yakuza, which does have its charm in stealth. I grabbed four points worth of it and headed into the diamond for a slight change of pace. This was a grave mistake. My diamond stealth track record is bad, and half the time that's just because I seem physically incapable of completing the pressure plate puzzle. Case in point, attempt one here where I failed to reach the diamond on a simple enough pattern. This run then rapidly devolves into a case study as to why running Yakuza would have been the death of me had I attempted it full time, as my baby face was blasted back to pre-planning by just the first set of SWAT spawns. It definitely didn't help that after investing big in Yakuza, I was still running Hostage Taker, meaning any time I took a hostage in stealth, I was essentially ruining my own speed boost. Ah well, of course I make it right back to the Inner Sanctum on attempt 2, only to go loud after being spotted lockpicking the entrance. Crushing, but at least this time I actually got my hands on the diamond before being put in the ground by literally the most basic of security guards. Yakuza has proven itself useless, so I switch back over to Rogue for yet another hybrid stealth attempt, but with some actual tools to defend myself this time. Unfortunately I didn't make it far in stealth, but oh well, at least I'm not going to get one shot by any passerby on the street with this build. Hell, I even had the firepower to deal with minigun doses again. Things were really lucking up when R and Jesus blessed me with a perfect straight line on the tile puzzle. Even I wasn't going to mess this one up, just about getting out of there as the gas was released and setting up for the chopper escape. But sitting in a corner and waiting for Bile was never going to be enough for my ADHD addled gamer brain, as I actively sought out my own death, inadvertently finding exactly what I was looking for when an Isma Dozer ambushed me and completely decimated my entire armor and health pool in under half a second. Ah oh man. Classic Scout. It might be funny for you, but this was a genuine rage quit moment for me. I had to turn the game off and return another day after that embarrassment. Back at it, the break didn't save me from more heartache, but at least it was spread out over a couple of days this time. I was back on that yak as a bullshit and quickly caught out in the lobby on my first attempt of the day. Not a massive time loss though as I headed straight back in and redeemed myself at the tiles, securing the diamond and tiptoeing my way towards the escape. Except, I let my intrusive thoughts win, dropping an ECM and blasting my way out of the museum, failing to consider that a few security guards are more than any yak as a user could hope to take on, as I was gunned down effortlessly about 40 meters from the escape, with my crewmates quite rightly leaving me to my pathetic fate. This heist was really starting to feel cursed, but finally on attempt 6, I pulled myself together, once again stealth into the diamond before slipping up on the way out, as has become customary, but this time just doing what Scout does best and hoofing it, no questions asked, all the way to the escape van, just about beating the toll of the alarm this time around. That was a genuinely embarrassing performance that I can only apologise for. After this one, I'm comfortable letting you know you are better than me. All right. But we can't just keep moping around, there's plenty of time for pornography starring Scout's mother to become the third worst thing that's happened to him today, straight after those diamond runs. With a full 70% dodge build thanks to Sneaky Bastard and Ford Detection Risk, heading into Golden Grin, I'm hoping the odds will start to move in my favour. Sadly, this build was also terribly DPS anemic, meaning I needed every percentage point of that dodge to stand a chance against Skulldozers, and on run 1, even that didn't prove to be enough. Immediately switching back to a harder hitting build, as this Moscone one was still missing key skills, I avenged myself upon Dozer Kind, taking full control over the casino lobby with the wondrous range of the Jocelyn. With that, the BFD was free to do its thing, granting me access to the first dentist coffer, escaping the high straight away without looking back. Wanting to redeem myself in stealth, I decided to go silent on the bomb dockyard, running into the first of three of the least inspiring quick fire run failures possible, sprinting into the first guard that could feasibly see me on repeat. Then, out of nowhere, on run 4, once I found the first keycard and was able to get out into the more open train yard, the mobility of the scout setup came into play, hard carrying my limited stealth skills as I was free to parkour across the trains, trivialising traversal and setting up the Moretta for a quick raid. This one ended up being a pacifist run, at least as far as guards are concerned. I can't vouch for the safety of all civilians. As much as I would have loved to stealth Scarface Mansion 2 with only the baseball bat in hand, that really was too much of a pipe dream, as I was forced loud almost from the off. Whilst lot picking the power boxes to gain access to the mansion, Ernesto Souza somehow ended up covering me, taking the aggro from the responders and giving me the space I needed to get prepped for his impending assassination. The man himself is a bloody tank, meaning the takedown was less John Wick, more like a car crash in slow motion, as he ate through about 5 mags of pistol ammo on his way to the great beyond. Scarier than that fight with Ernesto though are the many snipers that spawned to ruin my mood on the escape. 
Sometimes having Vanilla Hood Plus is a blessing, and others, it just reminds me that there are literally 10 snipers on the map. Every rogue's worst nightmare. I'm fairly certain they would have put an early stop to this run had I need to escape the way I entered, but with the rear boat escape it was much easier to stay out of most of their scopes and just slip away without having to wonder what could have happened. Crime spree next, meaning we get a rare chance at a Halloween event heist on a standard Payday 2 challenge run. Prison Nightmare is a soft ball progression option here, but of course it's also a great opportunity to have my run ruined by a unique, never before featured enemy type. Of course, I get run over by a headless dozer. I wouldn't have it any other way. After paying the 20 continental coin toll to get back on the spree, Brooklyn Bank was next in my future, a heist on which the Jocelyn hard carried, one shotting almost everything with base crime spree health pools. Crime spree out the way, counterfeit is the safer bet over the Alesso heist next, as you can get halfway through the heist without a single cop responding if you play things right. Peak satisfaction is landing a triple headshot kill for the docking awesome achievement without even meaning to hitting the 550 achievement milestone at last on the Yell Wonk account. Not bad going, bearing in mind this account has basically only been used for years of challenge runs and very little else. The printing press obtained, I went to grab some ammo for the escape, only to once again get tased directly in front of a massive threat, this time a sniper. Rogue did its job though, miraculously keeping me alive, giving me that sweet confirmation bias that Rogue is incredible, I don't have to learn how to play this game better. Sorry to all Rogue users in the audience catching unnecessary strays there. Proof of that rogue inconsistency, I very nearly lost a 1v1 with a Skulldozer in the sewers, which was an awful lot closer than I would have liked it to be, but still we ride on to First World Bank. This Criticola Fueled Moscone build is ideal for hybrid stealth at the moment, enabling me to stealth all the way up to the vault entrance before I completely fail to notice both keycards in the back room, using my final pages for the second one and forcing things loud prematurely. This was just an opportunity though, as I'd burned through to the interior vault in a matter of minutes, and after witnessing the birth of new Dozer life, took it upon myself to destroy all four of the Jolly Green Giants in under 30 seconds for the Federal Assurance achievement. Clearly this is one of my higher DPS builds at this stage in a run. I'm going to have to slow this clip down as I'm like 99% certain that my slug Moscone just completely cross mapped a pair of swats. This thing's shots never seem to fly quite straight, but will randomly deviate to demolish a couple of unsuspecting fellas halfway across New York. It was at least useful for dealing with the shield roadblock on the way out to the escape, clearing the path for another first time completion. After self-immolating for no apparent reason, I attempt one of Murky Station, I pull myself together for a second clean run. This heist is far easier than its Payday 3 counterpart, although even with my scout double jump, I still can't obtain that same level of freedom. Still, Yakuza is excellent on this heist, making for an easy clear with relatively limited bloodshed. Now level 90, my builds are finally starting to take their final forms as I head into Boiling Point with an almighty break a crit build that's also packing Fain Death should I feel like rolling even more dice than I already am with Rogue. This build is monstrous though, as this is one of the first times I can remember making short work of the almighty Boiling Point tasers who didn't give me any issues. Dozers are now easy prey even when holding hands to try and take me down. I think I'd be mad not trying to milk footage from this run. Oh, that one was a real stretch. Anyway, after turning this guy into Xavier Renegade Angel, I was free to clear off and escape the compound as quickly as possible. Actually avoiding the sniper trigger at first, likely due to my speed, meaning I had an easy time setting up and wiping out all three overwatching my escape zone with the flechette breaker, resulting in a rare first time clear of boiling point. In true Yelwant fashion though, I went from a no hitter on the rock solid boiling point, only to end up on the wrong end of a coin flip in close quarters with a green dozer, who duly eliminated my entire health bar just like his brothers did before him. However, if I happen to win that coin flip and hit a crit, they end up disappearing just as quickly. Not so tough now, are you? Waiting out the escape, I had to actually run rings around a SWAT van turret to recover my loot, jumping quickly down the opposite chimney as soon as escape became available. 40 odd heists later, and we're back on car shop, but outside of this lady just wandering through a Molotov cocktail without a care in the world, very little of notes actually happened. We've come a long way since heist 1, so of course I'm driving out of this one with time to spare. Next up, I hate the biker heist, but I have to respect the theming and bring the breaker for this one. At this point, I'm starting to think that I've really built up this heist in my head after a few tough luck runs in the past, meaning I'm about as locked in as I can be when it comes around on every challenge. As a result, I was incredibly focused heading in and defending the mechanic. 
This crit breaker build was a cut above what I usually have access to at this stage, actually landing some massive critical one shots on dozers, and even tearing through the swap van turret so that I could always get it out of the way before any tricky objective. I also had complete control over the snipers as they started spawning in, meaning I had more freedom to flank around this heist than ever before. It does help that the mechanic didn't go on a wander into the garage, meaning I only had to deal with the objectives that I could dictate the pace of, meaning after one final cover section, the bike was ready to be driven off into the sunset, setting up the events of day two. Here I sprinted at a breakneck pace to the end of the train without slowing down, made the biker box hit the bricks with some substantial crit damage from the M13, then turned the breaker on the pursuing conga line of dozers and medics. Once these guys were finally wiped out, a path was cleared back to the other end of the train, meaning another first time clear and potentially the first heist in a challenge run that's ended with more than 100% accuracy. The biker heist ain't all that. Panic room next as I switch over to a new Jocelyn build to deal with the snipers on the next two heists. Sadly, this build is a little low on its damage output, meaning run 1 was ended when this heavy swat refused to be broken into a joker of my own and instead fired back. Attempt 2 started really well, taking down the necessary snipers with ease, before being rushed down on the rooftop shortly after, with nowhere near enough stopping power to defend myself. Switching back to the crit breaker, somehow attempt 3 went even worse as rogue builds hate having to deal with similar glass cannon style enemies such as the gangsters, putting me down before I even had dealt with Chavez. However, once those guys are out of the way, this build gave me much more control over the corridors leading up to the panic room than I had with the Jocelyn previously. After soaring through, I once again took over the roof, popping the snipers before they could land a shot on me in a high risk display of dominance. Bile did me a favour by dropping the C4 off the side of the roof, meaning it was much safer to pick up and place downstairs, with only the final rooftop placement slowing me down. Clearing off from the roof, all I had to do at this stage was essentially survive two more assault waves, the first to strap the magnet to the panic room, and the second for Bile to take off with it. This ain't my first panic room rodeo, so I was already halfway to the basement by the time the chopper was lifting the cash out. An intense but well played clear that fully displays the rogue problem. Sometimes you just smash your way through a 20 minute plus heist without any issues, others you get dropped by the first beat cop you wander into. Not learning my lesson from before, I still gravitated towards the Jocelyn for the sniper killing section of Brooklyn 1010, but it appears to have seriously fallen off at this point without the concealment to crit. I was dropped in the second apartment block, failing to notice that my auto FAK activation was still on cooldown. Switching over to the tried and true breaker build, things went much better on attempt 2, making it down to the escape location cleanly until I pushed my luck trying to grab a convert at the escape, instantly eating a sniper round that put me in range of instant death from just about any other damage source. This is why Die Hard is such a key skill on runs like this one. On attempt 3, I was very nearly overran at the drill objective until my crits finally started to land, pushing back and for the second run in a row, landing back down on the pavement. A swift right hut from a cloaker forced me into one of the most clutch FAK placements I've ever managed, dropping it in the same instant I would have taken lethal damage, to stay on my feet and fight back against a pair of minigun dozers who stood in the way of the escape. Nicely timed crits were again enough to clear a path and flee this heist, with absolutely no FAKs remaining. The Yacht Heist is always a nice change of pace at this stage, always being a satisfying stealth affair when things go well. I didn't really have any close calls on this one, meaning I could save two pages for the control centre guards whose heads were bat magnets right before the exit. At this point, I finally remembered to purchase the Claire 12 gauge for a secondary slug option, which I could leverage whilst retaining my flechette primary to deal with snipers. I kind of forgot I could even purchase this thing, but better late than never, as it was a perfect option for undercover. Admittedly, my slight damage deficiency meant I was run over on the rooftop on run 1, but attempt 2 started much better as I quickly got the Tapsman into position as we got busy with his face. Having access to Unseen Strike, I could actually crit, making the setup a lot more deadly up against dozers. Sadly, I completely forgot to place the ammo asset, meaning I was slowly worn down by medics and dozers, sponging up my shots, and in the end, just had to flank around the heist to mess with their AI and stay alive, sprinting to the escape around a hail of sniper fire as soon as the decryption was complete. If you thought that one looked tricky, Slaughterhouse is a mountain of a challenge comparatively. And I have this disorder that makes me irresistible to dozers. Like, all dozers. Everywhere. As not for the first time, a Rheinfell wielding green dozer shot me out of the air unceremoniously. Attempt 2 was cut short just as suddenly, but this time by a veritable firing squad caught at the entrance of the warehouse. This one encouraged me to switch my build, sticking with the breaker but putting together a high concealment clear to seriously assist with the almighty death with shields. Sadly, this too wasn't enough, as I was bullied to the floor in almost the exact same spot the previous run was cut short. 
My next experiment was to switch over to a Slug Round Moscone and M13 for dozers, as undoubtedly the pistol secondary does a better job than dual shotguns against the big guys specifically. I wasn't well equipped to deal with snipers who'd come later, but for the first section of the heist, this build was ideal, smashing the drilling objective and securing six bags of gold in a single trip to the shipping yard. I was saved by a combination of foresight and decent fortune when snipers spawned in and stole my entire health bar, only for an FAK I placed earlier in the heist to come in clutch, keeping me afloat. With all eight bags in the container, I flanked back to the slaughterhouse entrance, which felt marginally safer than being out in the open, but still forced me into incredibly intense gunfights with minigun dozers, and always left me on the edge of having to clear out the sniper spawns with no prior knowledge of their exact locations. It seemed luck was on my side though, as I was able to get the container into position and just sprint for the exit. After a triple shield wipeout, it didn't seem as if any other SWATs actually bothered to show up to block my path, meaning this was another massive clear to notch up. We're on the final straight now as Locke steps in for Beneath the Mountain. The initial entry to the compound was an easy sprint for the dual shotgun build, up until my slug round Claire took care of the ambushing shields at the airlock across 40 meters. This taser had mercy on me and just lost interest in his job, giving me a second chance he'd live to regret. I ran into no interruptions really on the storage hacks, granting me safe passage up to the top level of the facility. Here, half the snipers on the map were wandering around on the ground floor, and without the damage to actually one-shot me, I had enough time and dodge procs to clear out the entire area. Here, this double shotgun build was able to come into its own, with massive slug collaterals on shields, and huge unseen strike takedowns on previously dangerous bulldozers. This was a relative no-hitter in the end, flying off on the first attempt. Back in the air, Birth of Sky offers no such luxuries as I was dropped before even completing the gauntlet on attempt 1. 2 went much better, actually making it down into the sewers, where I found myself tossed around and ragdoll without the time to convert a joker, meaning all the heat was focused on bringing down my minuscule health pool. I didn't survive the parachute down on my next attempt, leaving me questioning who exactly thought it would be a good idea for us to be able to take damage in the air when we can't even fight back. Frustrating, but at least when I did make it to terra firma, this crit bill was tearing through all the regular enemy types thrown my way. Sadly, without perfect play or insane luck, the escape in the sewers was still a crapshoot, with just too many enemies and not enough room to actually maneuver around. After being shot directly out of the sky once more, I switched again to the pistol focus build, which seemed to do the trick. The extra points of dodge kept me healthy, and the money pallet spawned kindly, meaning I made it down to the sewers without having even placed a single FAK. This supply of 14 in my back pocket meant I could just brute force my way through, backscattering them all over the place to keep me topped up as the crit M13 just about had the damage to take down a Skulldozer in the clutch, and then slowly thin the pursuing horde to give me a chance to lay down the second Thermite and jump into the escape boat, although it's fair to say my legs were the faster option when it came to the escape. Heat Street now, and this one's difficulty is ultra front-loaded, meaning it's not hard to go down on the first bend, which is exactly what happened to run 1. Attempt 2 made it past the dreaded beat cop hurdle, but kept having nasty curveballs thrown my way. A SWAT van turret pinned me down at Matt's car crash, but I had the crit DPS to send it packing for the escort section. Snipers were also a pain, but I believe I hit one of the longest range shotgun kills I think I ever have to clear a path. Shouting at Matt as the scout is also pretty satisfying. Nice hustle, tons of fun. Next time eat a salad. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Go, go, go. In the end though, a second SWAT van was just too much, as it suddenly minced its way through my health pool, just out of range of an FAK, right at the escape point. This late slip up led to a cascade of three attempts that didn't make it past the first corner, repeatedly shut down by powerful beat cops, and then a fourth that was cut short by some mighty cop melee damage. One more failure at the police cars, and I finally had a run worth discussing. The first section of the heist was relatively easy, although escorting Matt up the final hill was fraught with danger. I had to push past a Skulldozer and just eat hundreds of rounds from a SWAT turret at the opposite end of the road. Even once up in the clearing, I had to grind my way through multiple dozers as my ammo supply began to dwindle before Bile finally had mercy on me and arrived to take us off the streets of New York. Definitely the toughest time I can remember having with Heat Street. Although Green Bridge is regularly even more of a problem heist, and I'm not excited to head into this one with a rogue build. This is the sort of heist that can go sour at the drop of a hat. You can think you're in control and about to grab a joker, and then bam, suddenly a Skulldozer has three shot you from a barely visible position behind multiple abandoned cars. On attempt two, I stubbornly only drilled the first three prisoner transports, which ended up being a mistake after getting unlucky with the informant spawn, but still managed to hold out and escort him up to the scaffolding with only a couple of FAKs used. Sadly, I got pushed by a pair of dozers whilst outside of cover, getting insta-down without a lot of recourse. 
Excuses aside, I am comfortable blaming myself for this failure on attempt 3. I have no idea why I allowed this single SWAT to slap me around and put me down almost single-handedly. By the time I made it back to the scaffolding defence in attempt 4, I was truly locked in, flanking around and avoiding standing in one place for too long. Strangely, the prisoner was snagged right as the balloon was being lowered, meaning that part was left behind, but the man in the chair was gone. That's good enough for me, I don't need logic, and I'm sure he's fine. Instead of even trying to engage the fixed dozer spawns at the escape, I just sprinted and double jumped my way straight through the parked cars, outrunning the chopper mounted turret and clearing this one after a fair struggle. Alaskan deal next, another great opportunity to get decimated by a school dozer whilst trying to convert hostages. This one isn't usually that difficult to heist though, and with answers to both shield and snipers in this build, I was in a decent position to control the fuel pump without interruption. The danger came when trying to release the boat, finding myself Marshall flashed right in front of a minigun dozer, but somehow standing my ground, flanking around the heist to get on board and free the butcher's boat. Here my build's limited damage output turned against me, as a pair of minigun dozers also hopped aboard to prevent the escape. Slowly backed into a corner, this one attempt appeared to be doomed until, for some reason, the captain took pity on me and just set sail anyway, ending the heist with more cops aboard than we had crew, but that's not really my concern. The classic diamond heist is something I do need to worry about though, but not all that intensely, as after breaking stealth early on, I'm easily able to speed through the well-covered map with 70% dodge and avoid most sources of damage. After the CFO got yeeted out of Bane's chopper, I nicked his spare change before heading into the vault destroying its turret almost instantly, as being able to shoot regular weapons is a huge advantage on this heist when compared to previous runs. The SWATs just didn't really bother on this one, allowing me to call in Bile for the escape without challenging me at all on the rooftop. Reservoir Dogs is a bit of a mixed bag, with the first day not causing too many problems. This taser had mercy on me, not for the first time on this run, so I have to worry if these guys have been taking lessons from the zappers in Payday 3. This was enough to escape to the far harder second day. The ambush is where this tends to get nasty, with the taser taking me down in attempt 1, before Skulldozer put a swift end to attempt 2 from halfway across the map. But with how the difficulty curve is shaped on this heist, once I manage to fight back against the SWATs in the lifts and roll good enough RNG to hold at the front doors, taking down all six fixed score those as spawns, I was in a great position to clear the heist. I was hit by a secondary ambush at the vault, which was a nasty surprise, but much more manageable than the initial one at the front of the store, meaning once I'd cleared a path, I was free to start moving the diamonds, landing another massive long-range sniper kill to give me the room necessary to secure the final bags in Mr. Blonde's car. Not wanting to tempt fate at this point, I simply rushed straight past the spawning dozers and made it to the escape van unscathed. Next up, Brooklyn Bank, not really a challenging heist in the past, which I'd love to say again, but I was taken down, pretty upsettingly, by a single sniper shot that I just didn't see coming, bringing the winch parts back into the vault. Six minutes under run two, I actually got the winch started this time, but was once again deleted by a single sniper. Running less than three quarters of a full health bar is really asking for trouble with this build. Early into attempt three, it looked as if tasers would be the death of me once more, with this one holding me in place for an entire firing squad, whilst another forced me to execute my own hostage before being able to convert him into a joker. Surviving this early scare though, I was presented with the drill objective instead of thermite, which we know from experience is far easier. After gaining access to the vault, I was absolutely bum-rushed by half an army, but fortunately the dozers amongst them decided to focus down my jokers instead, allowing me the space to clear them out and get back to pick-locking access to the medallion box to rush straight for the sewer escape. Hitting level 100 here, this is as strong as I'll get, with four builds to choose from depending on what specifically is required from the heist. For breaking feds, this is of course stealth, giving Yakuza one last chance to shine. We got lucky with the gate objective on attempt 1, but still ended up causing a classic guard chain reaction for being impatient with objectives around Garrett's office. On the plus side, I rolled the exact same RNG on run 2, which was pretty lucky, finding Garrett's office only patrolled by two FBI agents. Once cams were down, politely answering the pager, You're like a car crash in slow motion. It's like I'm watching you fly through a windshield. I was in complete control of the heist. Setting up motion sensors to track the guard's movement as Locke gave the clue for Garrett's safe code to set us up for an almost immediate escape. Henry's Rock is a very different beast though, as we move over to a crit deagle for as much firepower as I can muster. Even with that extra DPS, early dozer spawns can be fatal, case in point. Attempt 2 made it up to the first coffer, but the major downside of the deagle was found out, that being its limited ammo supply, meaning I was tased whilst out of rounds to fight back with, ending a promising run prematurely. Attempt 3 went even further, actually managing to signal the escape with a flare before heading back inside to wait out Bile's arrival, 
This ended up being a fatal error as the snipers inside terrorised me, taking my FAKs late into the run. Painfully, despite it being a feature of my build since about boiling point, I still haven't had a single feigned death proc on this run, which didn't change here when a murky dozer shut me down almost effortlessly so close to the escape. The following run made it almost just as far, with a dozer once again putting an unceremonious end to it with a single glance. If you were from where I was from, you'd understand that this kind of crushing failure is part of the course. So we go again, this time throwing the run once the cops disrupt my chemistry equipment at the last second. Switching back to the Deagle, I just needed a little more patience and strategy to go alongside that firepower. Baiting the cops further into the compound was the strat, until I got pinged by one of the two snipers inside, causing me to panic, throw the plan to the wolves and simply sprint through, just about having the speed and agility to secure the coffers and escape the heist. The final major hurdle on the way to the White House. I've got the flow of Shackleton Auction down at this point. You stealth right up to before snagging the keycard from the auctioneer directly to speed through the loud section of the heist. Dodge was working overtime for me on this one, and I'm incredibly thankful for the police force's stormtrooper aim when I was standing still lockpicking doors. Getting my hands on the obsidian plate was easy, and making a break for the escape wasn't that much harder. Hell's Island is no slouch on the difficulty front though, and if the abuse I got hurled at me in the laundry room is anything to go by, this won't be a breeze. Up on top of the prison, Locke apparently forgot to bring Bane along, at which point I was slammed by a minigun dozer who didn't want us abandoning our mentor on this one. On attempt 2, Locke actually remembered Bane this time, but a dozer I'd left on death's door still managed to basically one-shot me right before the helipad. Attempt 3 was unique, and it actually saw this run's first feign death activation. I know, unbelievable. I've been using this skill on and off for about 10 hours of gameplay, which is not great economy for a single activation. This has to be comic justice for my insane luck on the NG run. I had switched over to a more consistent but lower DPS build for this attempt, which made the escape a little tighter than I'd liked it to be, actually ending the heist with no ammo in either of my shotguns, but even so, the slug round Claire proved itself once more. No Mercy is regularly a victory lap for these runs to showcase the best of what they have to offer, but in true rogue style, I got cut down not once, but twice by the first responders to the hospital, showing its endless fallibility no matter who you're facing down. Once I finally got past these low health, high damage pests though, I was pretty much golden. This is the perfect corridor shooter build, and No Mercy is literally just corridors, meaning the wide shot can spread makes for a glorious mess over the hospital walls. I got unlucky with the infected patient spawn, and again with the sample purity, but that was fine as it just allowed me to pile up the bodies along the halls and work out some of that tension caused by the likes of Henry's Rock and Heat Street. I was admittedly saved by a curtain right as the elevator reached our floor to guarantee the escape, fleeing from the morgue without any additional resistance. That leaves just the White House. I got a bucket of chicken, and I'm here to kick ass. And I'm all out of chicken, so I lied about the chicken. This is the grand finale, but stealth is going to be key, as I don't fancy my chances up against dozens of roof turrets with this build. I cruised through the RFID boxes, but did slip up in the West Wing, forcing me to use my first pager and making it impossible to control the Piot completely. Instead, I needed to use up three pages to clear the entire area and avoid any bodies being discovered. After making it to the library unnoticed, I was into the Piot and ready to put an end to things. The three PC hacks were easy until I got caught staring into space, bearing in mind I was recording this straight after a Payday 3 drinking game challenge you guys will be seeing in the future, it's not a massive surprise. I just about had the time to grab the pardons before his limp body was discovered, but was still forced to sprint back out through the airlock as the loud assault wave was now closing in. I wouldn't have a run like this one end any other way though, as I was forced to hold the waves of spawning swats at bay with my Moscone whilst hacking the anti-air guns, successfully doing so just in time for Locke to land in and finish off yet another TF2 challenge run. Miss Pauling would be proud. I might not have recovered the intelligence, but I have cruised my way through the seventh Merc run, with this one actually being the rule set I've been dreading taking on the most. I don't think I've ever had a challenge where I've had to change my build so frequently, which was a breath of fresh air as it felt like I was trying to puzzle out what strategies work best for every single heist. This one had its ups and downs with huge first time clears and the likes of Boiling Point and the Biker Heist, but other unexpected roadblocks like Heat Street and the Diamond. But with only the Soldier and Medic left to take on the Payday 2 career mode, I really have to say this has been an incredible series. I'd love to hear some ideas for future rule sets in the comments, especially for the Medic, which is going to be a tricky run to conceptualise, but even so, I'll make sure it happens. Thank you so much for watching, take care, I'll see you all very soon. 
And don't forget to try out Enlisted, just follow the link down in the description and you'll be immersed in a conflict like no other. A huge thank you to my dedicated Patreon backers. If you want to join this crew in Going Infamous, check out the link below and pledge as little as $2 to see your name in the credits, or get 24 hour early access to future videos and vote on upcoming content. Take care, I'll see you all soon.